Welcome to Module 5, The Romantic Era, in our Music for Music Appreciation class. In this module, I have divided our slides up into lessons because this is a very extensive unit. I'm going to give you quite a lot of time to go through this PowerPoint. And as you've probably noticed, there is one available where you can simply read instead of listening to me talk you through all the slides. At any rate, as you can see, we go from the rise of Romanticism through the power of the miniature. We look at some Chopin, some Schubert. Uh, we talk about Schumann and program music, which you'll figure out when we get there. Russian music, uh, Smetna with Mavlas when he was a Czechoslovakian composer all about big choral societies and groups and opera and some reflections. So this is kind of a long module and let's go ahead and dig in. First, we talk about the rise of romanticism and what is that? Romance is basically passion and how we respond to that in our lives and a lot of times we think of it as flowers and candy and dating, but here what we're looking at is an entire era of the 19th century and the culture of the time. This has to do with a big era in music history and in art history and all over the world. So think of it this way. Romance with a small lowercase r is our traditional idea. Romantic with a capital R is all about this era of arts and history. The Romantic movement in music and literature was a cultural shift and the main thing about it was that we see personal expression coming to the fore instead of just sticking to the rules as we did in the classical era. We had lots of extremes of emotion, everything from being jubilantly in love to terror and heartbreak. Uh, before this, people didn't show their emotions so much, but now it was no holds barred, everything out for everyone to see. Beethoven, of course, was the composer who bridged that gap from classical to romantic. We'll be taking a look at some of these romantic characteristics and how they work their way into the music and art and poetry of the time. As you see here on this slide, and you'll see a list a little bit later about some of the more brilliant creative folks of the time tend to have a tendency to die young, very tragic. Here's our list. George Bizet through Robert Schumann, you can see None of them lived past the age of 46. Most died before the age of 40. In the classical era, musical form was very strict and standard, uh, very much based on structure and balance. In the Romantic era, things remain important, but the structure became more extended and kind of uh, became more exciting and vibrant and vital. Some of the other things that were going on had to do with social and political things, stuff that was challenging the very structure of society, uh, changes that happened as a result of the Industrial Revolution, changes that happened when people moved from rural areas into metropolitan areas, and changes that happened in the economy with the advent of free enterprise. Some of the good things about this was that when people were earning more money, had more disposable income, they were able to participate more fully in the arts. Another thing that happened was as a result of the Industrial Revolution, we had uh, more affordable instruments being produced because now they could be mass produced. This meant more people could have music in their homes and they were getting lessons and music lessons and they were actually even having performances in their homes. Take some time with this slide and go through and click all of these links. You'll see how some popular and rock songs have borrowed melodies and things from 
Romantic Era works. So just go through the list with Radiohead, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, etc., and see how these relate. Just click on each one, listen for a bit, and you'll hear the relationship. It's really kind of fun. This slide takes us through some typical romantic musical characteristics like an emphasis on melodies, richer harmony, uh, even more use of dissonance, um, composers tending to use instrumental forms in an even bigger way and expanding them. And we had more louds and softs, more wider dynamic ranges as the orchestra grew, so did its power and the palette of sound that was available to the composers. Exoticism was a big thing in the 19th century, in the Romantic era. People were traveling more. There was more ability to see exotic places. And so music and arts became set in some of these exotic places. The public was just wild about learning about places like Japan or China or even America, the west, western part of America. Uh, we saw folklore becoming important. Uh, and nationalism was growing. So this was a very exciting time in music with a big expansion of the musical languages that we could use. There was also a big interest in the supernatural. It inspired a lot of composers and also artists. And of course, industrialization also gave rise to some new anxiousness in society. So people were expressing that. Here were some, a list of some pieces that had to do with composers' fascination with things in the supernatural. Uh, Carl Maria von Weber, opera, The Freischutz, uh, Franz Liszt's Faust Symphony, Wagner's The Flying Dutchman, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, we'll hear more of that later. Mazorsky's Night on Bald Mountain. Click on this link, this one here, and you'll hear that as it was set in the Disney film Fantasia. And also we're going to hear Goethe's poem, the Ulkenik, <clears throat> which was set by Schubert. Uh, you'll see that um, coming up soon. A little bit of a comparison chart here. Classical era was rationality, balance, scientific things. Romantic was uh, beyond the rational, beyond the ordinary, uh, hearts on their sleeves, revealing thoughts and dreams, lots of imagination. Here is a list of some general characteristics, just sort of a recap for you. <clears throat> more musical material, richer palette, bigger tone color, wider dynamic range, longer structures, uh, more technical virtuosity, more preoccupation with nature, uh, interest in supernatural and religion, focus on national pride, nationalism expanded, everything was subjective instead of rational, uh, real interest in long ago things, the Middle Ages, it's chivalry, love, and a desire to get away from the rigidity of the previous musical forms of the classical era. During this time, the piano evolved into something with more capability. In Mozart's day, the piano had around 60 keys, Beethoven had around 80, and now you might know that we have 88 keys. It also is a stronger instrument. It got louder, it got bolder, just like symphonies did. So there was more musical expression available with the piano and with the orchestra. Today at home, when we're looking for entertainment, we usually watch movies, we might binge on Netflix series, we might play video games, watch some sports. But of course, in the 19th century, that wasn't around. So people would gather around the piano and they would play together and sing together and it would be their entertainment for the evening. Uh, 
Oftentimes a singer would come and sing songs with the piano accompanying. So often also one of the things was just the person playing the piano just by itself without a singer or an instrument with it. And so one of the big important pieces was the piano miniature that evolved just short character pieces for the piano. <clears throat> the piano miniature is a solo piece for piano kind of short and small scale that just depicts one mood. It's not very long. Lots of composers wrote miniatures for the piano. Here are some of them. Beethoven, Schubert, Mendelssohn, Chopin, Schumann, Brahms, all wrote these types of pieces. The reason the miniature became so popular was because of the way that people consumed or bought or used music. Instead of a single patron taking care of a musician or a composer, the Romantic era composers were kind of independent business people. They were writing what they wanted to write and going ahead and selling it or getting royalties from performances and sheet music. And we also saw, as I was mentioning before, house parties where people would exchange their musical ideas and perform for each other. This particular word, Schubertiades, were just parties and events, and they were things where friends of the composer Franz Schubert would sponsor these parties. And the idea there was to show off his latest work. But at those parties, they also had poetry, dancing, card games, other activities. And so things like that were places where some of the small pieces would be performed. Another thing called a salon, which was usually something like a little fancier party organized by some sort of wealthy person. Uh, and it would often be a woman. And the idea behind it was simply to entertain people, to please them, to educate them. Often a lot of women would gather together, read their poetry, perform their compositions and exchange ideas. The salon was one of the very most important things, especially in France, uh, where people would gather, <coughs> share ideas and work. And uh, Franz Liszt and Frédéric Chopin were among the two most significant pianists and composers of the area, era, and they often gathered in these salons. Another popular performer was Niccolo Paganini, who was a phenomenal violin virtuoso. And Franz Liszt, the pianist, was very handsome, very attractive. Uh, women would actually just swoon when they would see him. And then if you click on this link here, you'll be able to hear one of his more famous works, The Wild Hunt. In Germany, on the opposite end of the showiness of Liszt, you'll find uh, Robert Schumann and his wife Clara. They would perform, and uh, they had a more warm and heartfelt quality than Liszt's fiery virtuosity. Uh, if you click this link here, you will listen to the piece called Traumerei. This was from Schumann's piano cycle scenes from childhood. And just Take a listen and see if you can reminisce about some innocent childhood dreams. In all the piano composers of the time, Frederick Chopin is the one who is a real standout. He has some amazing music, and he pretty much limited his output to writing for the piano. Another type of music at the time was called the art song, or in German, the lead. Uh, more than one song is leader. Uh, Schubert and Schumann were both well known for their leader, beautiful types of works for piano and solo voice. Some of the earliest art songs had very simple melodies and accompaniments, and they were usually structured either strophic that's sort of like a verse like a hymn where each verse of the poem is set to the same music 
modified strophic, where the music might have some sort of variation to accommodate the text, or through compose, where it just went from beginning and end, trying to show the text and how it related to the music. Click on these links to hear some examples of that. A few other basic things about art songs. Almost all the time, there is a piano that accompanies the singer and only a piano. Once in a while, you'll find another instrument added in, but mostly just piano. Uh, poetry was usually the inspiration and very often a composer would set a particular poem, sometimes some sort of old standard poem that they would know, like one from Shakespeare, uh, to make the music fit the poem. And the lead was intended for a small and intimate type of performance, not a big, large concert in a giant concert hall. Sometimes the composers would put together songs along a same theme, uh, which would be called a song cycle. We actually see some of that type of work in more popular music, like the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, uh, kind of progresses through a theme, as does Eagles Desperado. Uh, you'll find others. And then here are some examples of some song cycles by Beethoven, Schubert, and Schumann. Coming up next, we take a closer look at Chopin. Uh, he was called the poet of the piano, and he liked to perform for the salons. This is a picture, a particular type of old style photograph called the daguerreotype of Frederick Chopin. He was born just outside of Warsaw in Polish. His father was French, his mother was Polish. He grew up in Warsaw and studied there, then went to Vienna and Poland, but he mostly lived in France, which he considered to be his home. He was going to Vienna, from Vienna to uh, home, and he had learned that the Russians had crushed a Polish uprising. So that's why he didn't return to Warsaw and ended up moving to Paris, where he uh, lived the rest of his life and loved it there. He had a 10-year romantic relationship with Madame Aurora Dudevant, who wrote under the name George Sand. She was a novelist. Um, Chopin has many types of moods in his music, the nocturnes, the ballades, the etudes, mazurkas, polonaises, all uh, showed his mastery of the piano and his heritage from Poland. Uh, and just all of it is quite beautiful music. We have a couple examples for you. On this slide, you'll see the Nocturne in C minor when you click on this link down here at the bottom. Uh, you'll hear many, many different examples of the types of techniques he used in his music when you listen to this. Now, Franz Schubert was particularly known for his songwriting. He did write symphonies and quartets as well. Uh, he was born in Vienna and uh, gave, uh, received music lessons from Antonio Salieri, who was one of Mozart's rivals. Uh, this is his portrait by William Reeder. He first worked as a teacher in his father's school, but didn't like doing that, and so he was able to get support from his aristocratic friends so he could spend his time uh, composing and performing. Schubert contracted syphilis in 1822 and ended up dying in 1828, but he left wonderful, wonderful music. If you want to spend more time learning about him, you can click on this link down here. This is uh, a full length video about his life. One of Schubert's most famous works is the art song Erlkönig. Uh, it was an immediate huge success. 
based on a poem and ballad by Goethe. I invite you to click on this link here, which I've repeated and spelled it out here for you, uh, to see a, uh, a video that kind of takes you along through it and explains what's going on in it. And then I think you will also enjoy this link, which has some really amazing sand art that goes along with this song. So I do hope that you will click on the links and listen and enjoy Erlkenig. Now we talk about Schubert. Some people get Schumann and Schubert mixed up. That's understandable. This is Robert Schumann. Uh, really uh, amazing life, colorful but tragic. He did die young. Uh, quite the romantic, really just the, as the slide says, uh, the quint quintessential romantic. Uh, he actually um, worked in music criticism and influence. He had a journal that he wrote in, and that helped Chopin and Brahms to become well known as well. So he was highly respected, very influential, uh, died quite young and had some terrible uh, mental illness issues in his life. He was born in Zwickau. Uh, he had a family that encouraged him in his artistic pursuits. He did decide to study law and uh, in order to support his family but he was passionate about music and by the age of 20 he just surrendered to being a musician. He studied with a man named Friedrich Wieck and um, Wieck assured Schumann that he could become a successful concert pianist. But Schumann injured his right hand. He actually caused his own injury by uh, trying to make the hand even stronger. He tied some weights to a finger and it ended up injuring it so badly he was not able to continue that career, but he did become a successful composer. This is a list of some of his successful early works. He was uh, suffering from severe depression partially brought on from the deaths of his brother and sister-in-law from the cholera pandemic of the time. He did recover and founded this journal called the New Journal for Music, which became a journal of music criticism. And that is how he was able to help Chopin and Brahms and others. His wife, Clara, was a brilliant young pianist, the daughter of his teacher. And uh, the father did not want them to be married, but later a judge overruled the father's objections and they were able to be married. Uh, people have said that these were probably some of the happiest years of Robert's life. It was also some of his most productive. You can see here that all of the works that he was working on and completing at that time. They both pursued musical careers, Robert as composer, Clara as a, as a pianist, and she often performed her husband's work. Clara, by the way, was also a very fine composer. Sadly, even though they were deeply in love, Clara could not fend off, as this slide says, she could not fix Robert's struggles with bipolar, and he even had hallucinations. Finally, he ended up... Uh, attempting suicide, and he actually uh, lived out the remainder of his life in, a, in an asylum. He uh, also seemed to have advanced dementia, which may have been the result of syphilis. And um, in the 19th century, I want you to remember that asylums were not uh, great places at all. They were horrible. They were filthy. They were frightening. Uh, people did not how, know how to treat the mentally ill. There were horrible stigmas. We still have a lot of work to do with that today, but there are some better facilities to help people deal with depression and addiction now. He uh, became worse and worse and ended up dying at the asylum.
It is also thought that he suffered from multiple personalities. And uh, there's a link down here. If you click on this, you'll see a, a pretty good video about uh, how some of that may have actually influenced his compositional process. There's also a link on this middle section here to hear a piece from his piano quintet in E flat, the scherzo. It's uh, it's fiery and excited and and amazing harmonies and. Uh, I think if you listen to that, you'll sense some of the Im impassioned melodies and rhythms that he was creating at this time in his life. Schumann was very familiar with chamber music that had been created by his predecessors, and he loved writing chamber music, but he also wanted to be an individual, so you'll you'll hear differences in his scherzo that you just listened to versus, say, the Schubert or a, a Beethoven scherzo. This scherzo has two trios. So we have a scherzo, the first trio, a scherzo, the second trio, and back to the scherzo. That's a little bit different from the typical scherzo structure that was sort of like a minuet and trio before. You'll look through, you'll see uh, more agitated melodies, fierce rhythms, more virtuosity, uh, and this slide will help describe some of the musical things that are happening, uh, ascending, that is a rising melodic line uh, in a fancy rhythmic meter called 6-8, a compound duple meter. That means two groups of three. And uh, the two trio sections each have different music. So go back to the previous slide and click on that link if you haven't yet and listen to it or do it again and see if you can follow these characteristics within the music. Another important aspect of the Romantic era is program music. This is music that rather than simply being part of a uh, structure, very formal design, actually goes about telling a story. So there was a lot of influence on music that was like literary, novels, poems, pictures, arts, uh, cultural references that had a great deal of influence on the composers of the time, and they responded by writing music that would reflect these uh, cultural references and sometimes historical stories. Program music needs to be instrumental, doesn't have singers, and usually <clears throat> this inspiration, whatever it is, if it's a dream or a myth or a story, is identified before the composer writes it. So they say, oh, wow, that's, a, that's an amazing story. I'm going to write a symphony about that. These are common forms of orchestral program music, a concert overture, a tone poem, also called a symphonic poem, or a program symphony. Felix Mendelssohn is well known for writing concert overtures, and they were very, very popular. One of the ones that you can hear in by clicking on this link is the overture to A Midsummer Night's Dream. He wrote a set of instrumental musical pieces to go with the play A Midsummer Night's Dream, the play by Shakespeare. And this overture uh, really demonstrates that he captures the story of the fairies in the Midsummer Night's Dream. Hector Berlioz was known for his program music and especially for something, something called Symphony Fantastique. <clears throat> uh, Mendelssohn was in Germany working hard and making wonderful music with Midsummer Night's Dream. While he was there, Hector Berlioz was in France, uh, really amazing everybody. He fell in love at first sight with an actress by the name of Harriet Smithson. Uh, she was 
actually already taken at the time, but eventually he pursued her so diligently that he won her hand in marriage. But it didn't work out. She became jealous of his musical success and recognized that he wasn't really in love with her. It was Shakespeare's plays. She was the actress, and he fell in love with the actress doing Shakespeare's play. He didn't really know her as a person. Anyway, it was one of the great love stories of his life. He wrote Symphony Fantastique, and it's often thought that this was inspired by his passion for Harriet. Berlioz wanted people to understand what was going on in this symphony, so he actually provided information about the uh, program, the program behind the symphony, uh, so that the audience would know what was happening in his story. Here's the first part. He writes, a young musician of morbidly sensitive temperament and fiery imagination poisons himself with opium and lovesick despair. You can read the rest of this to go on, but you can see that uh, it doesn't kill him. He has a weird dream and visions, and this is transformed into musical thoughts and images he writes out in the symphony. The object of his affection has become a particular melody. Uh, an idea fixé, a fixed idea, as it were, a little theme, like a light motif, which we hear all throughout his Symphony Fantastique. It's unusual in a symphonic work in that it has five movements instead of four. Um, this is not totally unheard of. Even Beethoven wrote a five-minute symphony. It probably stems from the fact that French theater usually had five acts, so that kind of helps solidify the structure of the piece. The five movements are reveries, passions, a ball, a scene in the fields, a march to the scaffold, and the dreams of a witch's Sabbath. The idée fixe, the fixed idea, is sort of this signature tune, this little tune that comes throughout the whole piece. Uh, and it symbolizes his uh, his love, Harriet, and he keeps transforming his little tune into the different uh, emotive states that he's feeling about each movement. In the dream, he believes he has killed his beloved, he's condemned to death, and led to execution in a march. He sets this march in sonata form, which we talked about last unit, right? Um, it goes through the couple of key areas. He gets led up and down steps. Uh, we hear a brass band come in and play. We hear drums. It's a very, very dramatic piece. I invite you to find this link here at the bottom right. Click on this and watch and listen to a performance of the March to the Scaffold. During the Romantic era, nationalism came to the fore. Nationalism was basically uh, composers taking great pride in their own heritage and writing music that reflected their heritage. So they would use dance rhythms, folk music, uh, different musical modes to make the music sound like it really did come out of their particular background. Um, Chopin using Polonaises and Mazurkas, which were dances of Poland, uh, is a prime characteristic. Dvorak and Smetna using uh, tunes and dances from Czechoslovakia in their music. Uh, one of the big groups that was very nationalistic was the Russian group of composers, and we're going to take a look at some of that music right now. In Russia, the music for the court was usually coming in from Vienna or the opera houses. But during the, uh, after the late classical, early romantic, the political winds were sort of shifting and the foreign composers were not as welcome. We began to see the development of a Russian national school of music. It began with Mikhail Ivanovich Linka. And then he passed on his desire for a Russian school, meaning a, 
a way of composing music that was particularly Russian, to a group of composers who eventually became called the Mighty Five. Among them was a composer by the name of Modest Mazursky. He wanted to see realism in music, so he tried to imitate the sounds of the Russian bells, of the massive crowds, and things like that. He used altered meters so it wouldn't stay in one beat pattern the whole time. It would change as it goes through. Uh, he would use folk modes, different types of scales in his music that weren't necessarily major or minor scales. They would be just a little different. Native dance rhythms, all sorts of things. In 1874, he wrote a great opera called Boris Gudinov, but he also wrote a set of pieces originally for piano called Pictures at an Exhibition. To get inspiration for this, he went to an art exhibit which featured paintings by his friend Victor Hartman. Victor Hartman had died the year before, which really affected Modest Mazorsky, and so he chose several of the paintings to inspire him to write this program, Piano Music, and he was very effective at doing it. If you listen to the whole piece, you can almost feel as if you're walking through the art gallery. This painting on the right is the last of the paintings in the cycle of his piano music, and um, the reason this painting looks like it does is that there was a, a contest to design a great gate for the city of Kiev. It was uh, came out of an assassination attempt on Tsar Alexander II. Uh, Hartman won the contest. The Tsar actually never did build the gate, but Mazorsky was so inspired by the image that he wrote one of his big pieces for it. It has a bell tower, big arches, very, uh, very grandiose and impressive. So uh, the piece is also very grandiose and, and impressive. Another piece that was very striking was uh, inspired by a drawing called Baba Yaga, the hut on chicken's leg is about a, a folklore tale about a witch named Baba Yaga. Unfortunately, the original drawing was never found, but it is said that it was modeled after this uh, clock design, where you see the clock, some chickens up here, and if you look very carefully at the bottom, you'll see the chicken legs. Anyway, the piece called Baba Yaga runs right into the piece called The Great Gate of Kiev. So I'm providing here a link for you to listen to the pair of those pieces, Baba Yaga and the Great Gate of Kiev. So click to that and listen to the pieces. There are lots of other examples of program music, and I think that if you take the time to listen to some of these, or at least to parts of them, you will really enjoy it and you'll understand more about what program music is. I've provided here links in each of these boxes to different pieces. Okay. This Le Prelude, the very first tone poem ever written. Schumann's Carnival, it's a piano cycle that sort of reflects his multiple personalities. Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet Fantasy Overture is one of the most famous pieces ever with one of the most famous love themes ever. If you listen to this about halfway through it, you'll hear the love theme, and I'm sure you'll recognize it probably from some commercials that you have seen on television. Scheherazade, another very famous piece. It's uh, very exotic, captures Orientalism. This performance is led by Gustavo Dudamel, our Los Angeles Philharmonic composer, uh, conductor from Venezuela. This particular performance was made by his youth orchestra in Venezuela. It's very impressive. I urge you to click on that and watch some of it. Uh, Camille Sasson, a French composer, wrote a piece called Carnival of the Animals. Wonderful piece. This link is only to one of the movements, the March of the Lions, but I urge you to explore YouTube and search around for more sections of it. And then finally, Smetna's Ma Vlast, which means my homeland or my fatherland, is a very long symphonic cycle of six tone poems. It takes oh, an hour and 20 minutes or so for the whole piece. We're going to be talking about uh, 
the second movement, the Moldau, in uh, shortly in this in this slideshow. So uh, if you click the link, you can listen to the entire cycle or skip through and listen to portions as you wish. Smetana, here is the river. Uh, I cannot pronounce this river. Lutava uh, translates as the Moldau River. Um, as it goes through Czechoslovakia, very, very beautiful river. So this is where he is setting his impressions of a trip along the river to music. An interesting thing is that Smetana, just like Beethoven, became deaf in his later years. He is said to be uh, pretty much the founder of the Czech national musical style. He was born in a small village and got really caught up in all of the nationalistic and political agitation that was going through the area because of the Austrian attempted domination of that geographic area. Mavlas is probably his most significant work. It can be translated my fatherland or my homeland. Um, doesn't quite literally translate into English very well, so people call it either one. It is the set of six tone poems, as I said before. Um, each of these pieces were conceived as independent works. They each had their own separate premiere, and then they were all put together as one big work in late 1882. But it's perfectly okay to just perform them one at a time, one piece at a time. And very often, the Moldau of Last is the one that is performed the most often. The, the piece really describes the course of the river, starting from a couple of small string, springs going all the way through to a single river through the woods, the meadows, by a wedding, uh, out by some water nymphs, some rocks, and uh, goes through the rapids and widens and goes towards Prague, and it ends at the Elbe. There's a lot of contrasting musical sections as it goes through. Uh, this link over here called Insider's Guide will take you to a video that has a, a commentary alongside it, a written commentary, so that it can help you identify all the different parts. So click on this link and watch that video. One of the other important things that was happening was the rise of what's called the Choral Society, basically meaning an expansion of musical forces. Now we saw music for chorus or chorus and orchestra in the classical time. Now it becomes even bigger. We had longer works. We had more performers required, both bigger orchestras and bigger choruses. Um, the works themselves, it used to be maybe 35 minutes. Now we're 40 to 50 minutes, some over an hour. The classical orchestra might have had about 40 players. The romantic orchestra, 60 to 100 players, sometimes as many as 120. But this is where we're talking about right now, the expansion of performing forces in choral music. Something called choral society. Choral societies, these were formed during the 19th century. They basically were groups of people that wanted to sing together, and they became a very vital organization for the public and for their various communities. Excuse me while I try to get this hair out of my eye. There we go. Singing in a choir often required less, uh, less skill, it could be learned more easily than uh, some of the needs for playing in an orchestra. So this offered uh, the general public an outlook outlet for their own artistic energies, and it gave opportunities for amateurs to perform in public. We saw mass, uh, requiem mass, oratorio, motets in earlier eras, and now we see just basic choral music, including short pieces, longer pieces, um, <clears throat> but a development of choral forms 
that were derived from the text that was set or from trying to go into sonata or rondo form. And uh, so we saw a lot of growth in the chorus society of the time. This link on this page, Yaxit de Manon Alavelt, Sing to the Lord All Ye Lands, is a piece written by Mendelssohn, mostly homophonic, very full and rich. Most amateur choirs can do this song very well. And there were lots of these types of songs. This was a cappella, meaning no accompaniment, just the voices. There are now some very, very wonderful virtuosic a cappella groups. Uh, I'm sure you've heard many of them. And our own Chafee College groups do superb work at performing this type of music and also much more advanced music. <clears throat> We also saw that these societies began to have uh, bigger works that included the orchestra. Uh, things like the works called Elijah and Paulus by Mendelssohn. But very often, the piece of the type of music that was set for a large chorus and a large orchestra was a requiem mass. Johannes Brahms and Giuseppe Verdi both wrote beautiful impressive requiem masses. Neither was particularly devoutly religious, but they both wrote their masses and the masses were very different from each other. For Brahms, Brahms, instead of wanting to talk about <coughs> fear of death, <coughs> decided he wanted to console the living and prepare them for calm and serene acceptance of death. Uh, so he derived his text from the German Luther, Luther Bible rather than the Catholic Requiem Mass. The Requiem Mass has a Latin text that is preset, but Brahms wanted to focus a little bit differently. So here is an example, if you click on this link, of one of the selections from his Requiem Mass. This is called How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place, talking about the beauty of heaven. Giuseppe Verdi composed the other really big mass of the 19th century, his Requiem Mass. It was definitely Catholic and a heavy duty setting of the Latin Catholic Mass. A lot of people have called this work his sacred opera since the solo voices involved really have to be of, of strong operatic quality. And the chorus needs to be very well trained and very highly skilled. The second section of the Catholic Requiem Mass is the Dies Irae. It's about the anger of God. It's about facing judgment. and. Um, we have a performance here, which I would like you to access by clicking this link. And in this performance, you'll see this hugely dramatic style. Uh, you'll also understand the word and text painting going on. We hear the orchestra literally trembling as the tenor sings, Quantus Trema, how great a terror. We hear offstage trumpets preceding the word tuba mirum, Bargen sonum, the trumpet scattering a wondrous sound. The, the bass sings going down to the lowest part of his range. So it's, it's a very exciting piece, and I urge you now to click on this link and watch this performance as conducted by Zubin Meta. The uh, Mendelssohn choral example was more conservative. The Brahms and the Verdi were very dramatic. Introspection on Brahms' part, fury and terror from Verdi. But basically is that we can understand that these three works tell us that we had basically three levels of choral societies that emerged during this Romantic era. We had cities and towns that had amateur groups that work well together and work hard to put together good performances. We have 
performers as in the Brahms Requiem that needs a larger, more polished choir. Uh, they would have to have some experience and training to do well. And then at the far end, you have a choir, a very large choir made up of a lot of professional voices. The average choir, like the city and town community choir, could not perform something like the Verdi Requiem. It requires some training, lots of rehearsal, lots of work. And now we come to opera. Opera was probably the most loved genre of the Romantic era. The common people loved the big spectacular show that opera gave us. It was a celebration of music and all the arts because it involved acting and costumes and scenery and sets, all sorts of things. We had three basic types, the Italian opera, Bel Canto, Beautiful Singing, and Verissimo, which was about opera set about real life events. We had German opera, music drama, often set about mythological types of events. In France, we had what was called the Grand Opera, very impressive, uh, lots of huge choruses and crowd scenes. So all three were very popular and remain so today, although we probably see more Italian and German opera than we do French today. But some of the French operas, like Carmen, which we'll be talking about later, have become the most popular of all time. Bel canto of Italian opera literally means beautiful singing. Important composers of this type are Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini. Beautiful, flowery, melodic lines, uh, lots of beautiful singing stars. Uh, Jenny Lind was known as a Swedish Nightingale, particularly important soprano of the time. Composers that were sit writing this Italian type of bel canto opera were crazy popular. Rossini and Verdi and Puccini, all especially very, very popular. This is just a lithograph, a picture of some of the five most important opera composers of the day. This one up here is Rossini. The Barber of Seville was one of Rossini's most popular operas. If you click this link, you'll see the final moments of the opera and just uh, pay attention to how virtuosic the piece is that is being sung by the lead tenor. And then also Donizetti's opera, Lucia de Lamamor, has a very dramatic section with vocal fireworks. This is the mad scene. Uh, so click on this link to experience that one. Verdi is pretty much known as the, the master of the dramatic Italian opera. This was the Italian version of Grand Opera. Verdi was born in poverty. Uh, he had good musical skills, but the conservatory actually rejected his application for admission. I bet they were embarrassed later when he became musical hero of the country. Uh, there was a wealthy merchant who became his sponsor, and he uh, had some success as an opera composer um, early early on. Uh, th this didn't last, and he his uh, children died later, and um, his his career didn't do well. But then finally, his opera Nabucco became a surprise hit. Uh, the La Scala, La Scala is the great opera house in Milan. The work Nabucco had a lot of political undertones and the Italian public loved to see that because they wanted a new free unified Italy out from under the influence of the Austrian Habsburg Empire. Um, the piece I've got for you to listen from this piece is called The Chorus of the Hebrew Slaves. It became an unofficial anthem for Italian 
sovereignty, that is to, to have their own country, not under the rule of the Austrian Empire. Eventually, uh, it, Italy did gain its independence and Verdi actually served in its parliament. A lot of people think of Verdi as having the most drama and passion of the Romantic era. He loved melody. He knew his audience. He didn't write for the musical snobs, the intelligence, but he wrote for the general public. His music was very passionate and rather unconventional, but very successful in the end. In his middle years, Rigoletto, Trovatore, and Traviata were his operas that actually were greatly successful. Any opera house uh, performing them basically would sell out. The uh, subject matters were challenging, however. You can read about them here. Deceit, treachery, rape, fratricide, sacrifice, prostitution. Uh, the censors in Rome demanded changes uh, so that the story would be more acceptable to conservative goers, but Verdi said, well, a whore is a whore. So uh, these, these operas are still controversial today in that sense, but they were nonetheless quite successful at the box office. The opera Rigoletto was based on Victor Hugo's work, The King Amuses Himself. The problem with it is that although it was bringing up a sensitive and probably all too real subject, it was very distasteful. He believed in the moral intention of the play Rigoletto, which had to do with uh, the court jester Rigoletto, whose daughter Gilda is so passionate that he wants to take revenge for the fact that a man of power and influence was abusing her. The opera was somewhat revolutionary. It didn't have very many traditional arias. It had a lot of interaction between all the characters. It was very intense. In Act 3, Rigoletto wants his daughter to see the truth about the Duke who has been abusing her. Uh, in Act 1, he had gained Gild Gilda's heart by posing as a student, but he wasn't a student. So Rigoletto plots to expose the Duke as he uh, is romancing yet another woman. There's a divided stage so that we see Rigoletto and his daughter on one side and the Duke and Madalena on the inside. So outside, Rigoletto is trying to convince his daughter that the Duke doesn't love her and that uh, and the Duke goes into the tavern on the other side and sings about how women are fickle. And then uh, Madalena comes in and flirts with the Duke, and she already knows of Rigoletto's plan. Then there's a quartet. All four of these characters sing at the same time, uh, advancing their own stories. It's pretty amazing. So. Uh, click this link and you can watch the performance of the beginning of Act 3 of Rigoletto. Another style of opera called Verismo, which basically has to do with realism, uh, was something that Giacomo Puccini became a very popular composer by using. This is uh, sort of at the end of the Romantic era, called post-Romantic era, uh, used realism to tell stories that would really relate to people, everyday people, down-to-earth subjects. These are some of the composers, Mascagni, Biancavalli, and Puccini, who was the most famous, trying to bring naturalism and realism to the operatic stage. La Boheme is a very famous opera by Puccini. Um, this is probably his most famous and, and the one on which he made most of his wealth. Here's a poster for La Boheme. 
for his uh, production. The melodies in this uh, are very memorable. A lot of the most famous opera arias and singers will sing these melodies, uh, even in separate performances. All through this, we get the setting of realism, we get the beautiful melodies, we get the orchestra reinforcing them. Uh, the plot is pretty simple. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl. Boy reunites, but the girl dies of tuberculosis in the boy's arm as the curtains fall. Not a lot of character de development. There is some drama, a lot of drama. Most people could relate to these characters as they live their bohemian life. This uh, opera kind of served as the backdrop for the 1987 film Moonstruck. So uh, it might be interesting for you to see some of La Boheme and watch the film Moonstruck and see the relationship. There's a link on this slide, Gilida uh, Manina, that frozen little hand, where Rudolfo, the lead, uh, is singing to Mimi. We move on through to German opera now. Richard Wagner is the most well-known composer of German opera of this era. He's very powerful, very influential. When he was a young boy, he wanted to be a poet and playwright. Then he discovered the music of Beethoven and ended up studying scores. He actually never became a successful performer on a musical instrument, but he was a master of music composition. He rose as a musician, he be, uh, composer. He was appointed to be the leader of the Dresden Opera. He composed many operas. He uh, ended up being in a lot of debt and he had to escape Dresden for Switzerland for a while. He began working on uh, the ring cycle uh, a huge operatic cycle uh, of music dramas. Now, Wagner did no, long, no longer called them operas. He called them music dramas because one of the things he worked towards was he wanted to control and design all the elements of the music drama. That means the set, the costumes, uh, the way the music went together, the way it all fit together. and um, there are four music dramas in this cycle. Uh, that's Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Goethe Dameron. Um, the Rheingold, the Rheingold, the Valkyrie, uh, Siegfried, that's a character, and Twilight of the Gods. There's a lot of stuff needed to do the ring cycle. It's um, probably reminiscent to you of uh, Tolkien's cycle of The Hobbit. And the Lord of the Rings cycle. Uh, we have swords and beasts and dragons and castles and uh, huge sets and costumes and amazing things. Now, rather than try to explain this whole cycle to you, I have added a link here of Anna Russell and her analysis. Now, Anna Russell, this is an older lady and this is an older video, but I think you will absolutely love it as she sits at the piano and tells you the story of the ring cycle. So click on this and go, go on through it and enjoy her. Now, as I said before, Wagner had gotten into bad debt, and here we have King Ludwig II of Bavaria. He was sometimes called Mad King Ludwig. He was just 18, but he loved Wagner, and he had just become king. So he paid off Wagner's debts and gave him an annual stipend, and he helped Wagner build a special theater in the small town of Beirut, which Wagner called the Festival Theater, which was designed by him 
in order to produce the ring cycle opera. Now, the ring cycle takes 17 hours to perform all four operas and get through it all. So thanks to Mad King Ludwig, we have this fantastic theater in Beirut, uh, Bayreuth. And uh, if you want to spend 17 hours listening to opera, you can go there and see it all at once. For Wagner, the idea of the number opera, which meant that the other people who wrote opera in the classical era would say, okay, number one is the overture. Number two is the aria about this. Number three is this. Instead of that, he wanted to have it all stream together and work together. He called it an unending melody, and it would work well with the German language. This called Gesamtkunstwerke, which meant uh, the whole of the artwork. Wagner used a musical tool called a leitmotif. A leitmotif is a tune that represents a particular character or object or thought. Wagner wrote over a hundred of these for the ring cycle, and he would keep transforming them to help tell the story. Now, if you want a good idea of what a leitmotif actually is, think about the music of John Williams, for instance, in Jaws or Star Wars. And I have provided a couple links here so that you can play those and remind yourself of his music. The story of the ring is about a magic ring and about the magic ring getting stolen and forced to be handed over and the Valhalla home of the gods being built and all sorts of things like that. At the very end of the Valkyrie scene, uh, at the Valkyrie, there's a big sword motif and a big orchestral conclusion. So here's a link so that you can listen to that. When we come to French opera, uh, literature was highly connected with French opera. Along with that was Lord Byron and traveling to exotic places. So Byron was an example of the Romantic spirit. This far off land's fascination uh, contributed to what we call exoticism. And some operas like Puccini's Turandot was from China, Estiani's Vasco da Gama was from America, and Bizet's The Pearl Fishers from Ceylon, which you now know as Sri Lanka. But in France, the exoticism of Spain was the thing that was really interesting, partly because of Moorish influence and also because of the gypsy culture in Spain. And so the opera Carmen is one of the most famous and successful French operas. It did uh, describe and portray proletarian life and immorality and lawlessness, uh, tragic death. It was a new ground for French opera. It was controversial. And so setting it in Spain made it work better because it filled the exoticism requirement. Basically, here's what happens. We have this beautiful girl, Carmen. She's a gypsy girl who works in a cigarette factory. Don Jose is a soldier who falls under her spell and falls in love with her, even though he is engaged to Michaela. And Carmen tries to lure Don Jose into the world of smuggling and gypsy life, but he can't bring himself to leave his respectable military life. There's a, another soldier, Lieutenant Zuniga, who tries to seduce Carmen. Don Jose becomes jealous and attacks Zuniga, so he can't return to his regiment and he deserts the army, army and hooks up with Carmen's smugglers. But his happiness with Carmen is short-lived because she falls in love with Don Jose, the bullfighter. Carmen and Don Jose quarrel and she tells Don Jose to just leave and go home. 
Carmen and her friends tell fortunes through cards. She draws the death card, the ace of spades. Michaela comes in search of Don Jose, trying to rescue him from himself. Escamilla, the toyador, Escamillo, the toyador, arrives. He and Don Jose start to fight with knives, but they are separated. Michaela tells Don Jose his mother is dying, so he goes home to be with his mother. But it's not over. He warns Carmen that they'll meet again. And at the end of the scene, the, the crowd hails the bullfighters. Escamillo comes in with Carmen, and she's all excited to be his escort. He goes into the bull, wrong, bull ring, and she remains to face Don Jose, who can't get over her. Carmen won't give up her freedom. Eventually, Don Jose stabs her. As Escamillo is acclaimed by the crowd, she dies, and he kneels down beside her. There's a lot of famous music from Carmen. I have chosen to give you a link to the Abenera, which in French uh, says, Love is a Rebellious Bird. Uh, this is a very exotic and erotic song. So uh, click the link and go ahead and listen to that. And it was a very popular Cuban dance song from Havana. It became popular in the early 19th century. And so you'll hear that as you listen to the song. So we've seen there's a lot of variety and diversity in romantic opera, bel canto, verismo, and of course the exotic. There were a lot of external influences in the Romantic era, the Industrial Revolution, social changes, political changes, a new middle class wanting more entertainment, bigger is better thought, wanting everything to get larger, orchestras larger, music bigger, music longer, all these sorts of things. Virtuoso performance, performers becoming very popular, still are popular today, right? Think about um, our pop artists and their popularity. Uh, the world of the supernatural was important. National identity and nationalism was important. Virtuosity and storytelling. Extremes in setting of Requiem from Brahms' calm German Requiem to Verdi's uh, Requiem of Fire and overt emotionalism in the Romantic era is one of the biggest characteristics. No more restraint. Your exam for Module 5 will be posted in Canvas, and the due date will be showing on that. I'm going to give you a little more time than usual on this because it is such a long unit. Enjoy the music.